shock coming home, discovering the family you never knew you had. Um, we give this talk once a year, and once a year I get to really revisit my own family of origin, so you're going to have an opportunity to really get to know me tonight. Um, and speaking of that, today, um, our daughter Erin, who's turning 20 uh, in November 19, she's living in Ottawa, studying at Carleton University. Um, it's been apropos that she was with us today and left today because it was quite an emotional day. Um, uh, Catherine drove her to the airport today while I was prepping for the lecture and, and came back and uh, I said, so how was it? And she just said, what do you mean, how was it? <laughs> and her eyes were red. And, and um, we didn't talk very much about it, but it was a very sacred kind of somber moment. And it's been very, very um, a powerful experience for us watching a daughter leave home. How many parents do we have in the room? Um, you know, when I was, when I was um, young, when I decided to leave home, I, I, I just remember leaving home. Like, see ya. <laughs> right? I'm, it wasn't, I wasn't thinking at all about what I was leaving. I was only thinking about what I was going to. And I really had no idea the impact that that would have on my mother. And she's often said, because my first walkabout when I was 19 is I hitchhiked around uh, the perimeter of the United States. And I phoned her on Mother's Day from Atlanta, Georgia. And she's always referred to that story as a very important moment. And I always thought, well, yeah, well, you know, I just called it Mother's Day. But I actually didn't realize we don't stop to think the depth of what's going on in our relationships and our family of origin. And Catherine said the other day, she said, you know, I feel very, very fortunate and very, very grateful that I can go running down the seawall with my daughter and we, we sync up our iTunes so we're on the same songs and the same playlist and we can jump up and down and sing and, and we can talk, we can sit down, we can actually have a conversation. I don't recall having that kind of conversation with my mother or my father. I don't even recall thinking about having that conversation. I also don't think I thought too much about what it must have meant for them to not have that conversation. A lot of us didn't have that conversation with our parents. And we assumed that they would just get over it or it didn't mean that much. Or they're the, they're the parents and we're the children and we're leaving home. And their job is to watch us go bye-bye. Not realizing the depth of the heart that is involved in all family relationships. And the it's caused me to really reflect on, on the story that I live with from my family. You know, I've, I've come to believe that who we are in large part, in large part, is a reaction to the story we carry about our family of origin. The story we have is that we think is just the fact of the matter and we think we know the story, and who we are, all of our belief systems, who we, our sense of self, our sense of relationship and authority in the world, all of it comes from our interaction with our family of origin and the story that we walk out with. And parents, parents, um, there's more to the story than what they present. All parents decide on how they're going to be a parent. And what do you think they make that decision on? What do, they, what do they refer to when they're going to decide what kind of parent they're going to be? Any parents got any ideas out there? Sorry? Their parents. And what happened there? Or didn't happen there? All good intentions are going to make right now what was wrong then. Right? We have nothing but good intent, so we present a front, a posture, and some of it could be very well organized and even well educated, 
And others could be just reactionary, like I'm just going to be a controlling parent and make sure that my child isn't like what happened when I was, a, you know. That's good, positive intent. But it's much like a Trojan horse that's passing on the unfinished business of those losses, those pains that happened in our childhood that are not sorted out, not resolved. We make conclusions about them. And now we walk into parenthood with all our best intentions, but what's driving the horse or the engine is the past. And in our attempt to uh, get away from it or have a different future, the more we are driven by the past, that's what we're delivering to the, the present and the future. And what we don't work out in our own families of origin, our children will then act out. Despite, despite our best intentions. So, if, the, if, the, if who we are is a reaction to the story we carry, and we actually only know a portion of the story because we only know the front, Thus, if we actually knew more about the story, our reaction to the story will change, and actually we will change too. Now, this is not um, a standard approach to a therapeutic intervention with with therapists by and large. Most therapies are organized around hearing your story, buying your story, and helping you survive with your story. Very rarely will we take a good look at that story. So often we just accept the story as we understand it and just learn how to cope with it, passing down this drama to the next generation to sort out. And tonight I also want, I mean, I get excited about prepping for this, this lecture because I get to read my own notes and I get to remember some of the things that I came up with that I think I forgot along in the last year. And uh, one of them is I, I'm going to be zeroing in at the end of this on probably the most uh, important um, crossroads to come to as you review your own life and how you, you, you deal with healing your past. Or if you're considering being a, a therapist and a counselor in our PRAC program, how, this, how you can help you focus on this very, very pivotal piece in any intervention. So let's start with my story. This is the story I know. I'm going to be building, as uh, uh, Nazarene said, we, we, we use genograms in our practitioner program where in the first year of classes you will be presenting a three-generational, multi-generational view of your family of origin. And men are squares, and women are circles. But I'm sure we just said, we'll agree to be the squares. So there I am, Dwayne the Square, and I come from a um, family with my mother and father, Patty and Lorraine, Patty O'Kane and Lorraine Gagnon, that was her maiden name. My father was from uh, St. Bride's, Alberta, which is in northern, northeast Alberta, uh, not far from St. Lina, which is a French community. My father was in an Irish community having come over from Ireland in the 20s, half the town of Dungiven in Northern Ireland moved over here, much to their shock, I'm sure, because they were all in the textile business in Northern Ireland and had no idea what they were going to run into in their first winter in Northern Alberta. But nonetheless, um, my father was from St. Bride's, my mother from from St. Lina, and my mother was um, 16 years old, 15 years old when she met my father, um, and uh, she got pregnant. And the firstborn was my older sister there. To, uh, to, I'm in the middle there in the square, and the oldest is always on the left. So it's my older sister, then me. Then I have two younger sisters. Um, my older sister was born in 1948. My parents were married in 1948. I was born in 1950. I have a younger sister, Laverne, who I uh, was born in 1952, and then I had another sister who was born on my birthday in 1962. She was 12 years younger than, than me to the, to the day. 
and the story of my family, the story I grew up with, was totally uh, impacted by my dad's use of alcohol. My father was not a uh, person that drank and, and, and became more friendly. And initially, I think he did. After the first drink or two, he would be a little bit more. He was quite sociable to begin with. But when he drank, um, he would come home and just raise living hell with my mother being the object and the target of all his animosity. And my being the only son, uh, I was very, very compelled from an early age, from eight or nine on. Uh, at eight years old, my father changed careers. He was, he was um, a carpenter up to uh, the age of when I was eight years old, and then he became a real estate salesman. And he did not have the temperament at all to handle having to make one sale a month in order to pay the mortgage. If he didn't make his sale, he got very, very anxious. And um, he, he just, his whole personality changed when he was, when I was eight years old. And um, he would come home in the middle of the night, raising hell, and usually bring some, some of the, the last two or three people that remained in the bar when it closed home with him and had absolutely no um, sensitivity, or perhaps he did have sensitivity, but he didn't, it didn't care about what he was sensitive to, how much impact he was having on, particularly my mother. So I would, go, I would come upstairs and make sure everybody was safe. And I would sit with my father, and I'd hear his story. And the story I, 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 I heard over and over and over again was how my mother and marriage ruined his life. That when, when my mother was 15, got pregnant, had a daughter when she was 16. Father was 22 or 23, so he, he had already been out of the home, already checked out the world a bit, you know, was a young adult. But he was a baseball player. He was a baseball player, and he was a good one. In fact, he told me he pitched against... Um, Satchel Page. Does anyone know who Satchel Page is? He's um, uh, probably the best uh, pitcher that has ever played the game. And up to about 1948, the, the blacks had to play in the Southern Negro League and they couldn't play in the major leagues. And they would tour the country and Canada challenging towns to tournament ball in order to make money. And they came through St. Bride's. It was actually St. Paul. It was one in the middle. It was a bigger town. You've probably heard of St. Paul, Alberta. And he told me the story of how he pitched against Satchel Paige. He said he lost, but it was a game right until the end of the, the, the ninth inning. And I thought this was just a bunch of malarkey. It actually turned out to be true. I, I, later on, after my father died in 1986, I actually found the man that caught for my father, and he confirmed the story. Nonetheless... I didn't, I didn't pay much heed to uh, these stories, but he emphasized over and over and over again his loss and my, how marriage and, and um, this pregnancy, which he had something to do with, had ruined his life, and he was just after my mother, punishing, 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 punishing. This is directed and dictated my course in life more than anything else is my impression of my father and his relationship with my mother and how it impacted our family life. Um, I'm going to walk through the stages of development for you. There's about five stages here of, of the sequence of events that occur once we have our story. In place that it's not questioned. My, you know, my story was my dad was an asshole. And everybody agreed. He wasn't always like that, but when he was drinking, he was. He had asshole behavior. He was also very personable, uh, very kind when he wasn't drinking, and a sensitive man. But when he drank, like I said, it was like all hell was breaking loose. And 
One of the worst things that ever happened to me was one night I, I invited a friend over named Ronnie Miller, who I went to Catholic school with. And he came from a home where it was more like leave, a Leave it to Beaver family. Really just nice ward. Cleaver was the father, just a nice man that always was there and steady and supportive and never having any kind of uh, anger in the household. Everything was just always kind and supportive and nice. Every time I visited there, I just didn't want to leave. In fact, when I was 12 years old, I, I came down with colitis and was hospitalized, and uh, I actually did not want to leave the hospital. I, I knew that in the middle of the night, nothing bad was going to happen. Anyway, so I had Ronnie Miller over for an overnight. You know, one of those overnights where you going to play Monopoly, make some popcorn, stay up as late as you can. I know, I think we were 10 or 11 years old. And it was Friday night. It was also payday. Father wasn't home for dinner. And I'm already starting to worry. Oh, no. Not tonight, Dad. Not tonight. 8 o'clock, no sign of him. 9 o'clock, no sign of him. We're still playing, eating popcorn having fun, 10 o'clock, no sign of him. Now I know this is serious. He's not just drinking beer at the pub. He's into the hard stuff. When he's in the hard stuff, this is when I can see the eyes of Satan coming out of him. Sure enough, one or two in the morning after we were fall, far, far asleep, he comes crashing in the front door with the sound of ashtrays hitting the walls and bodies falling on the floors and yelling and screaming and Ronnie Miller bolting up out of bed in his pajamas, and this is in January, in a cold winter in Vancouver, and gets up and runs right out the back door. He lives two miles from where I live. And he's running out of the house, and I'm running out after him. Chasing him down the street. What, I don't know what I'm going to do if I caught up to him. What, come back to this? But I just broke and fell on the street in tears and just nowhere to turn to. Because I was ultimately there to protect my mother and my sisters. wasn't sort of set up for them to protect me. That's one of the reasons I ended up in the hospital with colitis at 12 years old. But in that moment, I make up something about me, about people, and about life. From that story that is written in stone, We call it, I have SOS there, that is short for suspicion of self. Why is this happening to me? Why, why are we different than other families? It wasn't entirely true, but because families keep such good secrets, I thought we were the only family on planet Earth that was in trouble. Everybody else was leave it to Beaver or Archie on Elm Street in comic books. Everybody was okay except for us. The shame of the neighborhood. And I made up all kinds of things. I made up that men are bad, like guilty, like something to be frightened of, not something to turn to. I would say the only positive relationship I had with a man in those days was the priest at St. Mary's who took a, a, um, particular, paid particular attention to me and but men are bad and guilty. I am second class. My whole family is second class. Men are bad. Women are good, but they're also weak. They're there to be, be protected. They're innocent, but they're also weak. Because I'm watching my mother, you know, play with this thing year after year after year. Didn't leave. Didn't call social services. Nobody said, you know, like there was nights where she would take the girls and head off to my aunt's, which was just a couple of blocks away on, her, on my mother's side, and I'd be left with him. And I remember one night in particular where, like, he would, he would start off with such bravado, get out of the bloody house, you, you know, go on. And then 10 minutes later, he'd be broken. And one night he came crawling up to my bed, and I thought he actually died in front of me. Just completely collapsed, and I was afraid to touch him. And I was congratulated for being so um, okay. Dwayne can take care of things. And I did. But no one was taking care of me. 
So I made up all kinds of things about myself and my life, mostly from the launch pad of this story of what I am seeing in front of me. And from those suspicions of self, then comes a survival personality. And that is either a mask or armor. How am I going to survive what I believe about myself, about life, given that story as a fact? Who shall I become in order to be safe? Well, it wasn't hard. I was getting the message very early on that I was a super kid, like I was Superman, (laughs) Superboy then. And we all have um, survival personalities, given our stories. I want you to just think about that for a minute. What your story is, what was your suspicion of self, what did you make up um, in terms of who you had to be given that story, and who you still are given that story. Mine was being this super guy, Superman. Others are like, you know, to survive, you get to be right, you can be a bully, be tough, or you can be an over-functioner, you could be the planner in the relationship, always planning everything, making sure nothing bad ever happens, all driven by that, whatever story you're carrying. You could be an under-functioner, meaning I'm just going to disappear all the time, I'm just going to be invisible, if nobody sees me, then I'm not going to get hit, I'll just cooperate all the time. I'll be nice and invisible, codependent, meaning I'm going to, you know, the the personality, I'm just going to make the relationship everything, will shut out the world. So there's all, I can have an endless list of survival type personalities. When you just think about what's yours. And from that, Survival personality then comes rules for survival. Like a lot of us may think, you know, who I had to become is just who I am. You know, that's just what it is. It's no big deal. Everybody should just get used to it. But it's actually a not, not a neutral personality because you're walking through a minefield all the time. You have to keep your personality intact to make sure nothing bad happens again. And from that, you're going to have rules with the people around you about how they have to be. I'm hearing a few smirks. Right? You have rules. For me, um, it's don't, don't stand so close to it. Don't get too close. Like Superman is all by himself. He saves people, but he doesn't get saved. If you get too close to, you're going to um, you're going to, you're going to uh, drown me with your needs, because that's what I grew up with. Like, I was really careful. I was not a teenager that was saying, I cannot wait to get out of school and get in a relationship, get married, have some children. (laughs) I was watching some of my friends do that. I I couldn't understand it. All I wanted to do was get out in the world. And so, um, part of the rule, too, for me personally in relationship, because I was carrying my suspicion of self that men are bad, and I am one of them, my greatest fear is that I am like my dad then, right, is I will not accept um, criticism. I spent my whole youth being praised by women as being the savior of women against men, and if you criticize me, then I'm in the wrong camp. And so one of the rules that I would play, and if not verbally and, and um, overtly in relationship, it would be communicated subtly, is... Um, you are the problem, and I will be the fixer of the problem, but I am not the problem. Keep a distance, and we'll all be okay. Let me have my space, my independence. So it was like Superman, you know where he went for his time off? 
for Superman fanatics, I was one of them, to the Fortress of Solitude at the North Pole. And there he is. There he is. <laughs> I like putting that together today. You know, I, I look, I have a smile on my face, but there's nobody there, just me and the ice. I, I dated a, a girl in my 20s once, and I, I met up with her again in my 30s or 40s, and, and um, she said, Dwayne, you know, you, you, uh, you had a great beginning with me, and you had a great ending. Both were very colorful, but there was no middle. <laughs> we never had a relationship. You were just really good at the, the, the romancing and the chase and... But once the relationship started, I, well, I would just feel a switch go off. And I always thought it was because I had high standards. I didn't realize it was because I had a real problem going on inside of me that I wasn't even coming close to addressing, and I would leave. I'd go on to the next one, and the next one, and the next one. So um, all these rules that happen in relationship, um, as I said earlier, you know, some of the other rules that happen in relationship are like, Control by being the planner. Catherine knows that one. Um, it can be stay close as opposed to stay away. It could be stay close always or worship me. Make up for everything that I didn't get, I will get from you. And I got it all from a harlequin romance. Like this is love. The more enmeshed we are, the more fused we are, the more it's just you and me against the world, the more we cocoon. All driven by something that happened in the past, some sense of insecurity that needs rescue now from that pain. Or we'll blame the world together. That could be a rule in a relationship. It's you and me, baby, and we, everyone else is wrong. Give me what I didn't get. It can be, don't be an individual. That's a threat. We have to be a we. We can't have two eyes. We are a we. Do not be an individual. Don't have a life outside this relationship. If you love me, this will be your life. Hmm. Or a rule could be, only have a life outside of the relationship. You know, we're just sort of living together. We raised a family, and, but my real life is outside the home. Or her with the children and him with the, the, the team. Or I am right. That's a rule. I am right. Be a patriarch in the system. You know, with all things, when it comes to an impasse, we will default to me being right. May, may not be said as such, but it would be felt as such and known as such because if he isn't right or she isn't right, then the relationship's in jeopardy and it becomes a rule. One of you may apologize a whole lot more than the other one. Or women are right. All of this learned from our family of origin and all of it permeating from the launch pad of that story with layers now built on it all the way to a protective coding and a personality who you actually think you are. The sadness about this is the survival personality cannot be close because it's a strategy, it's a defense. It's a mask or it's an armor. It can, it's incapable. It can secure the love object, but it can never be in love with the love object because it will always be worried walking through its own minefield that something could go wrong and you have to keep your control intact. Otherwise, you shall be hurt again or bad things will happen again. And so there's a result to all of this. And it's a painful, tragic result. Like for, for my, my story, um, 
And as much as I made every attempt to not replicate the sins of my father and the level of intimacy and contact in my family of origin, my whole strategy system to avoid that pain to become Superman resulted in nothing but a, a, a series of tragic relationships. I had, you know, up, up to, to the point of meeting Catherine, really had not, even though I'd already started Clearmine, had some great ideas. Um, I really had not impacted the, what you will learn in, in, in our PRAC program called a level of differentiation. I, I, I didn't impact my level of differentiation one iota. I was still dealing with the same view of the world really as my father. Even though I looked different, I looked better. But I was no more capable of experiencing real happiness or real intimacy than he was. So that tragic relationship, series of tragic relationships, um, became my story. Now, my story can now be the beginning of somebody else's story. <laughs> if I carry on with my story now, I could have, if, if we didn't figure this thing out, you know, Erin could be up here in a, in a few years giving a lecture about her reaction to her story about my story. Nothing has, has changed. The baton has been passed. And it's very, very tragic how little can happen from one generation to the next. You know, we take the survival personality. We, it takes so much to wake up that this is not actually who you are. Catherine and I were working with a couple last year, um, and he was a clean freak. And they were presenting issues to us about her lack of cleanliness in the home. And that we had to sort this out or their marriage was basically over. Couldn't stand any kind of mess anywhere. And the way he described it, I mean, he, he was turning into her, her into some kind of um, street person. And if you're not careful, you could actually believe that that is the problem. I'm giving quite a, a silly example here, but I'm, uh, because a lot of times they're not so silly. They're easily, dis they could, could take them seriously that the, the needs of his survival personality would to be, was to be in control. Now, in our work with them, we found out that he was, despite the fact that he said he had a stellar childhood and there was nothing to look at, the story behind that story for him was that he was bullied badly in the playground as a kid, beat up uh, regularly, had no support from his family when he came home to tell them about it, and he, his survival personality was just to be in control all of the time. And we could, as therapists, we can run with those issues thinking that we have to sort them out. Well, let's work out a cleaning schedule. That's what we'll do. And all we're doing is rescuing him from his dilemma. We're not helping him heal his dilemma. And we as therapists are also just people and want them to feel good. And we will not differentiate ourselves the difference between rescuing somebody from their pain and healing something, someone from their pain. We like to feel good at the end of a session too. And a good therapist will be able to check on himself around things like that. This is really talking about becoming emotionally responsible human beings to look beyond this survival personality and the rules for survival. You know, the, the, I also want to say the survival personality will go into therapy. The, 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 the survival guy is going in for therapy, not the one underneath it. I can't stand the pain. Relieve me from it. You know, how do you spell relief? I want relief. Don't necessarily want healing. And this, this, um, went on and on for me like this in my own relationships. Uh, 
I mean, my, oh my, folks. I wish it didn't take me so long, but it did. Um, I was always attracted to women that were not attracted to me. There weren't many of them. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not pointing that out to, to be boastful. I was very, very uh, uh, popular. And, but the moment they showed me any serious attention, I actually thought maybe they weren't very perceptive <laughs> and would walk the other way. Like I disrespected them. Like maybe they're getting fooled with me like my mother got fooled with my dad. Do you follow me? A woman that would succumb to a man must be like my mother. I need one walking the other way because obviously she has, she's a stronger person. But the moment they turned the other way, so did I. Went round and round. I had a, my first marriage was, was very, very dramatic. Very, very dramatic. I chased her for years. Wrote songs about her. I really launched my whole musical career in the 70s. And uh, we went off for a vacation to Hawaii once. And, you know, we actually, you know, when you're in trouble like this and do not know how to negotiate any kind of true, healthy, intimate relationship, don't go on a vacation. <laughs> now you have to spend time together. 24-7. And... The other one has probably been waiting for this all year to spend some time together, and I am incapable of spending time together. And we had ended up some rows on the streets of Honolulu where the police actually pulled us over. Nobody was getting hurt. We weren't touching, but we were making a lot of noise. This is our vacation. A lot of couples need a vacation from their vacation, <laughs> truly. Um, and then the next relationship, I mean, that was, uh, uh, that marriage ended in, in 1980. Uh, then I went into my next one, which lasted 13 years. And it was even crazier than, we didn't, the police wouldn't intervene here. I think mental health workers would intervene instead. I mean, it was uh, completely bizarre, nutty, uh, intense, passionate, painful experience for both of us. And thankfully, it ended for both of us in the very early 90s, just after I formed Claremind. And then I met Catherine, she, and I, I gave her a bigger circle. But we'll bring her down to size shortly. <laughs> She's got her thumb up. So, um, further, I'm just going to continue telling my story about the tragedy that happens. Again, you know, it's all very consistent given this map I just showed you of how the launch pad is my story and subsequent strategies and um, sequences of, of character development and rules in relationships and in life that will all deliver the very thing it's trying to get rid of, which is that story. I'm just now a consistent contributor to this bad, tragic story. My parents broke up in 1982 and my dad committed suicide in 1986, he was completely alone, uh, abandoned or um, alienated most members of the family except for my older sister and myself, and I uh, was living in an old folks home. Even though he wasn't an old folk, he was actually younger than I am now, and I think about that. Imagine me in an old folks home. Um, but he had multiple sclerosis as well. He had contacted that in 1977, so the last 10 years of his life where he was completely, basically incapacitated, still drinking, and now I was bringing him alcohol because that's really all he had. I'd pick him up his bottle of rye and spend time with him. And then my younger sister, who I was very, very close to in 1992, died in, but she got hit by a car uh, on a Friday night. Um, walking across the street, um, uh, half intoxicated after just drinking. She, was not, she wasn't a, a problem drinker, but alcohol was part of her life too. And she was, you know, had she been sober, she probably would have seen the truck coming that killed her on contact. It's a big loss in my life. And uh, my other two sisters, um, my older sister probably took the, bu the, the, the bulk of the weight 
of the drama with my mom and dad more than any of us given that she was the firstborn. And she has replicated my father's life more than the, the, the rest of us as well. She's had a problem with, with drugs and alcohol her entire life, since her early 20s, when we both started um, engaging with recreational drugs and the psychedelic movement in the late 60s, early 70s. I was there with her, but she just kept on going down that hill and uh, became seriously addicted. And my younger sister was probably, remember I said she was 12 years younger than me, 10 years younger than my next sister. So we had all left the home, and she was left alone with the, the latter stages of my parents' relationship. And I really think that impacted her in a lot of ways. But I wouldn't, you know, I, I would not eliminate the impact that this whole system has had on her. So we're all carrying it. And we're all carrying the same story. So if I asked you, in, in the early 90s, I... I I got clinically depressed. That's what preceded the whole formation of Clearmind. I had crashed every, every that, that second relationship I told you about. Um, I invested so much in it um, and ran from it equally as much. Uh, but I gave up on my music career. I was a family therapist at the time working for the Department of Mental Health or Social Services. And... Um, the people I was working with were more concerned about their vacation time and overtime and booking off and uh, getting off their shift as quickly as possible. The integrity in the profession for me and the ministry was really certainly lacking. And I felt like a bit of a, a hypocrite and had no integrity in my own profession and how I defined myself as, as a musician and um, all those things. Everything I thought I was, I was no longer. So all of this was very, very consistent and predictable and sad and tragic. And it's not like I didn't want to get out of it and emancipate and be a better person. So you as a therapist, what would you do with this depressed man? I mean, I was clinically depressed. I could not, for about two years of my life, I could not figure out how to get through the next minute Never mind the next day. It wasn't one day at a time for me. It was one minute at a time. In fact, it was so bad, and, I, and this is no exaggeration. I used to look forward to having a cold because I would sneeze. And in that moment of a sneeze, I actually was present. I didn't have time to think about what was depressing me. I was, I, I was consumed by a sneeze. It was a total body experience for about two seconds. And then back to my tape loop inside my head. What a piece of poop you are, like... Your life sucks. You're nothing. You're uh, uh. What would you do with a guy like me? Even a mode of therapy would be, you've got to get your anger out about your dad. Right? It doesn't mean you're going to change your story. You might have to get your anger out every day about your dad. So long as the story stays the same, so will the anger. If my dad is an asshole, then I'm going to be a victim to the asshole, and that's who I am. And I'm going to have to vent a lot very frequently. Again, that is actually relief. But you're right. You're, no, you're, your suggestion is bang on. I'm just not going to get too far ahead of myself because I think our, our um, compulsion prior to that wisdom is to do, do a whole lot of other things that are akin to rearranging the deck chairs in the Titanic as a solution to the problem. You know, I could, you could help me figure out how to deal with my low self-esteem, do things that are going to bolster my sense of self. I could take medication. And that's usually the first order of business for any therapist that have been trained in the medical model, is I will treat the depression with antidepressants. Again, um, I'm not treating the problem, I'm treating actually what physiological serotonin levels in the body and how it's impacting the mood of the brain. Um, there may be a reason why I'm feeling what I'm feeling, and perhaps antidepressants isn't the best thing to do in that moment. At the same time, I'm not, I'm not uh, dismissing antidepressants as, as a, uh, a short-term solution to dealing with problems. If it provides you a flashlight with looking inside, great. But if it's just there to keep you away from what you actually need to deal with, I don't think that's so great. 
Or you might help me find a partner who will never challenge me, who will be just supportive and friendly. That would be a solution. I should go on a dating site and have my profile very clearly illustrating what I need for relief. Or suggest um, staying out of relationship completely. Yeah. You know, clinically, we call that first order change. We alter the structure of your life such that you don't have to feel the anxiety so you can function. That's called first order change. Second order change is actually addressing the things that are driving the whole thing. Or convince, we could have couples therapy, you know, could go see a therapist and the therapist could tell my partner back then, um, you have to give him more space. Can you do that? Focus on her being the problem, being too needy. The solution here is to allow him more time and space to be by himself so he can find himself instead of being himself in the relationship. Or build in a, you know, a support system to keep me feeling good about myself right across the board. As I said earlier, or just get my anger out about my, go to my father's grave and yell at the grave. All kinds of things dealing with what I made up about myself. I'm sorry, not dealing with what I made up about myself, but dealing with the survival personality and what that, that part of you or part of me needs in order to survive and cope with life. So I'm going to tell you now what I did discover. I went back to my, when I, in 1989, just prior to becoming depressed, I... I was doing my own, uh, completing my, my work at Pacific Coast Family Therapy Institute, doing my own, own genogram when I became a certified family therapist. And I went back and interviewed my grandmother on my mother's side. Right? Remember I told you my mother was 15 when she met my dad. They lived in a farm. She was the oldest. Um, there she is. There's, I'm going up a generation now. There's my father, Patty, and, Lorraine, and my mother, Lorraine, in white. And she was the oldest, if you take a look at that line, she's the, old, the oldest is always on the left, she was the oldest then of uh, uh, seven children on the farm as a 15-year-old. She meets my dad, and again, I grew up with this story, you know, that my dad did not want to get married, it ruined his life, I just, I just put together that it had to be some kind of shotgun wedding, you know, there were good Catholics, both sides of the family, and they just made sure that these two got married because of the shame around her being pregnant and then living in sin and all that craziness. So we're back to 19. I'm sitting there interviewing her. And thank God I had this interview with her. She died three or four months later. I've got two hours of this on tape. And I actually just found the tape yesterday. And so um, I sat with her. And um, I, I asked her all about what, what, what happened. And, and I told her my assumptions about my father's life being ruined by the marriage and not being able to pursue his baseball career. And I told her, you know, I just assumed that, that he didn't want to get married and that you, you uh, forced him to marry Lorraine. And here's, and I found, I, I, the reason I told you about the tape is I found the tape and I digitized it this morning. And for the first time, I've told this story for years, you're going to actually see my grandmother talking about this. Uh, she left home so young. She was only 16 mm -hmm. when she married. What was that like? It she was, was this is your first daughter? Yeah, my first daughter. She's 16 and, and, and she, she was pregnant. pregnant. Yeah. And to this Irishman, how, how, did, how, did, how did Louie and you relate to her? Well, I'll tell you this. Uh, I had a pretty much a yes pad for her, you know. And I remember one time, one Sunday after Mass, uh, I don't know, I guess I was sort of angry at him. And uh, I mean, Lorraine had just as much to do with it as he did, but I, of course I was blaming him. Because she was pregnant? or did you Yeah, because she was pregnant, you know. Well, he was a little older than her. And, uh, and I went over to talk to him. I don't know what I said. It must have been very nice. And he just shoved me and pushed me and sent me flying. And, oh, I, think, I thought Dad was going to kill him. 
Well, because I knew what I had done. You no, know, I thought that was, it was terrible, you know. I mean, I don't remember just exactly what I said to him, but it mustn't have been very nice. Because I was mad. <laughs> yeah, she was only 16 years old. Yeah, she was just a child, really. Mm -hmm. What was Patty's response when you were having to confront him about it? Was he saying, I want to get married, or I don't want to get married, or... Well, I don't know what I said and what he said, but he told me it was none of my business. <laughs> Whatever it was. You know. But he obviously wanted to get married. It was his decision. Yeah, it was. Yeah. It wasn't a, a shotgun wedding where Louis said, you have to marry my daughter? No, no, no. No, I think he would He would have he would said, okay, go on, go on, we'll take care of this. <laughs> the way he was feeling at the time, you know. You have no idea what that did to me uh, further on in the conversation when she said, you know, Patty, just go on, you know, get on with your life, we'll take care of it. What she meant by that was um, they lived on a farm. And um, in those days, when you're, uh, if your daughter had a pregnancy that was not wanted, nobody had to know about it. And my grandmother... My grandmother was still, um, Solange is her name, uh, was still giving birth to children herself in 1948. I have two uncles younger than me. She said, and Louis said to Patty, go on with your baseball career. We will t take the child and I'll call it my own. And Patty said, this is none of your business. I, I didn't sound too shocked in there, but I was stunned. My father was the one that made sure this marriage happened? Are you kidding me? He told, can you imagine? I mean, it definitely was their business. Lorraine was only 15, 16 years old. It is their business. My father had to be pretty certain about his feelings to say, butt out, this is none of your business. I love this woman. I am going to marry her. Are you kidding me? All of a sudden, things, it was like a domino effect. Everything just started shifting in my life. Remember I said the launch pad to my story was my dad was an asshole who was insensitive, did not care. I didn't know. I didn't know that he was 20 or, two or 23, he knew what he wanted. My mother was 16, and having six siblings beneath her on a farm. Tell me, please, how much time she had as a child. Virtually nil. Tell me how much of a sense of herself she had. Virtually nil. She had three kids before she was 20. I don't think it was a question, you know, you could conclude that she didn't love my father. I think she loved as best she could, but she didn't know how. I think she's still just learning how to do that. She didn't have time. Plus, he was feeling rejection. He started his drinking, made it even harder for her to love him when the focus was now my dad's bad behavior. But all the while, folks, and this is where the story changes. And if you haven't found the heart underneath your story you carry about your family, you don't know the whole story. It may be a wounded heart held, by, held together by scar tissue, but it's still a heart. There's so much these days about... You know, I think, I think the past is getting a bad rap. We just take for granted. We're, oh, yes, let's read a new book, see a new lecture, get a new tape about getting away from the past, getting rid of the past, right? I don't think we have to... I think the problem is we are getting away from the past. The problem is not the past. The problem is our version of the past. And there's only a select few of people that have the awareness, the education, and the privilege to begin to... Uh, let that question 
impact them in terms of their own lives. Like you, you are fortunate to be here that we're having this conversation about inspecting your own story of your past. How much do you call it reality? How much are you willing to see it as your version of the past? And that nothing's going to change so long as you keep your version of the past intact. You're going to need everything that's piled on top of it intact. Your survival personality, the rules, all of it. And you'll just pass on the story to your next generation. So, I started to realize that my dad was not coming, you know, he wasn't going to the pub to find new and better ways of punishing my mother. He was going to the pub to kill the pain inside of him. That every time he walked home and entered that door, sober even, he was wondering to himself, is she going to love me today? I didn't know that as a kid. But that was the story behind the story. Is she going to love me today? So that's, that's, the, um, that's the real story as much as I have on my family. But it is totally completely impacted me. Now, I'm going to walk through the same chart again, and if we take a look at that launch pad of the story, let's take a look at what that conversation with my grandmother uh, started in me. So, originally, if the story is my dad's alcoholism and all the bad things that happened, and that's what I carry. If the story, if there's a story behind the story, where is it? Um, The story behind the story is that my father actually loved my mother. No question about that for me after hearing that interview. No question. I was shocked. I was stunned. Put my grandmother up against the wall. It's none of your business. So the story about my father's alcoholism then changes from alcoholism to my father was actually hurting. He was All those assholes back there, folks, in all your lives. Underneath that is somebody that was hurting. And that's not to dismiss what they did, because if my father was still alive today, believe you me, we'd have a few conversations about those nights. It's not either or. You know, healing ourselves is not an eraser where we erase the past. It's a pencil adding in more information on the past. And this is the new information. The story now is my father was hurting. The beliefs from that story of my father's alcoholism was men are bad, guilty, I'm second class, women are weak and innocent and pure and good, and men are bad and evil. That changed to men actually make mistakes and can be corrected. And I'm worthy. I'm allowed to be in a relationship and I can make mistakes. Men do make mistakes. My my dad made some bad ones, but that's what they were. And underneath it all, his guilt around the mistakes he made was what he ended up dealing with when he decided to commit suicide. It's not like he wasn't conscious about what he had been up to. It finally hit him. So the survival personality was that I'm going to be Superman to deal with everything and be alone and all that to, well, I'm innocent too. Like, you know, that was a, that's a sad story I got. And I I tried to figure it out the best that I could, that I belong in this world and this life on an equal footing with everybody else, that I'm innocent too, and and the big one was for me to belong. You know, I've run everything in my life. I started ClearMind by myself. Catherine came on a few years later when I met her in 1995. But I started this. Everything I've done in my life, I started. Because I was too afraid to apply for a job I created everything in my life. Everything. And now I have co-created with that woman. And it's a wonderful, wonderful experience. I had no idea. I had to change my mind, though. Because when I changed my mind about my dad, I changed my mind about myself that I'm the victim. And if I change my, my mind that I'm the victim, I don't need to protect myself and be Superman and keep her the problem, Right? and keep her away and, 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 and push back criticism. I can accept comments and criticism and discussion and dialogue and messiness in a relationship without it having to equate with calling the police or somebody being put away or somebody committing suicide. Profound 
changes in my life as a result of this. So my rules for survival move from, uh, you know, rescue me by don't get too close to me, give me my independence, don't criticize me, all those things that change to connection and equality. And instead of a survival personality, it becomes, I'm sorry, I didn't tell you that earlier, it's like my identity changes from survival personality to identity. And now we make agreements. Instead of rules, we make agreements. Catherine's smiling, it's nice to see you. Around connection and equality, something my family system has not known. This is what Prague is all about. It's not about figuring out new ways to get relief. This is hard work. You know, it's hard work for the students, but it is so rewarding. And it's hard work for the teachers and everybody involved. It would be easier just to do relief formulas. Much easier. Go in to the depth of these stories because we're all committed to uncovering the soul, the heart of a family system and of an individual. What's buried beneath all of this is a heart that's beating, that wants to be known and wants to be remembered. And I tell you, you know, we, I, you know I'm not a woo-woo guy. <laughs> But every time I talk about this and remember my father, I feel like I'm connected. I'm, I'm, I'm just wanting to let him know that I know you. I wish you knew that then. But I see you and I know you. What is the result of all of that? In the past, it was more and more tragic relationships. Now it is, without question, a loving family life. That's all you get, right? It's a loving existence because you are brave enough to go back and ask yourself, where, is, where am I going to start this launch pad? Am I just going to go back to the survival personality and the rules? That's where we start? Or are you going to go deeper than that? If you only want to go to the survival personality, you want relief, uh, this isn't the place for you. This is not the place for you. This is place is for people that want to do a real um, important expedition in their life that your family is actually waiting for someone brave enough to do it. So, uh, discover the family you never knew you had so that the family you have can discover you. That's what uh, this whole Prack thing is all about. I came up with this line and I, I think it describes everything really, very completely and accurately about what we're up to here. That once in a world there's a program like this and once in a world there's a person like you. Thank you. <laughs>